Hi, I'm Simon Drew, and you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to find more episodes of the show, as well as articles and information about my one-on-one alignment coaching, then you can head to my website. It's simonjedrew.com. If you do have the means to support the show, then I'd love to see you in my Patreon community. Just go to patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew, where you'll also get access to over 240 episodes recorded before 2020. But for now, enjoy the show. Hey everyone, thank you so much for spending your time here listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. And today I have a guest on who was recommended by a few of our listeners, uh, none other than Paul Hannum. Uh, now, Paul, we just had such a fascinating conversation about, you know, current events, psychology, his book, uh, The Wisdom of Groundhog Day, uh, you know, all kinds of really interesting stuff that kind of pertain to uh, what's going on around the world right now. And uh, he's just got some great advice and and I'm really excited for you guys to hear this interview. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about him and then we'll jump straight in. Paul has over 30 years of experience in organizational psychology, leadership and personal development. His insights are based on expertise in the theory and more importantly, the practice of high performance. He taught at Oxford University and has four books published. Uh, He has also coached over 10,000 employees around the world and founded and built a major training and recruitment business. His new book, Significance, is a blueprint for flourishing in the new normal and refocusing your life on what matters most. His book, The Wisdom of Groundhog Day, which we talk a little bit about today, was the number one for self-help on Amazon and a Sunday best sorry Sunday Times bestseller. Uh, Paul specializes in working with leaders who want to achieve both success and significance and who want their lives to have greater meaning and purpose. And you can find his website uh, and links to his books in the show notes. And uh, and seriously, I really hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And I, I want to have Paul back on the show many more times. So I present to you, without any further ado, my interview with Paul Hannum. Okay, so Paul, really excited to have you here, mate. And thank you so much for spending the time with me. Um, you know, you came at high recommendation from some of my listeners and I thought this would be such a great conversation, um, especially starting off with a, a little bit of um, a conversation around your book, The Wisdom of Groundhog Day. But um, I want to let you introduce yourself to the audience uh, as they're listening to this um, and uh, just tell us who you are, uh, what you do, and then we'll jump in. Great. Well, uh, my name is Paul Hannum. I live in England, in Sussex, which is right at the southern tip of England, in a national park called the South Downs National Park, a very beautiful place, very historic town we live in, going back to the Middle Ages. And um, I'm quite an unusual career, really, Simon. So I started out life as an academic, and I started a doctorate, which I didn't finish, then went into the uh, IT industry, Uh, worked for IBM and uh, sold computer systems. Then I started a computer business in the 80s, which I built to about 500 people. Then in 1999, I literally had, uh, as my name suggests, Paul, a road to Damascus experience. And I read a book, and the book was called The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight by a man called Tom Hartman, who then became a friend of mine. And in this book, it really showed how civilization was collapsing because of the strain we were putting on the environment and because of this toxic Western culture of consumerism that we built. And all the ways in which I judged myself up to that point, you know, material success, wealth, status, power, etc., jetting around the world, going to conferences, having multiple homes, suddenly I realized that this was a disastrous way to live, that the very things which I thought I ought to be doing, having read this book and seen the real science laid out in a very compelling way, it struck me that I had to do something about this. So I literally stopped working in my business. I handed over the day-to-day running and um, went back to university, to, to Oxford, to try and initially to finish my doctorate, but ended up teaching there. And all the work I've been doing in teaching leadership, organizational behavior, which I also did alongside the IT, I I now apply to the environment. So over the next 10 years, um, I taught at Oxford. I then went to the States 
and set up three green businesses at the worst possible time. This was just before the crash of 2008. So yeah. literally all our businesses were doing well in 2007. And literally it's like a tap was turned off. The, the crisis, um, well, we're now living through another big crisis, but those of anyone here who lived in the States in 2008 will know what happened there. And um, then I came back to England. And since then I've, I've been, uh, I've now written four books, including Wisdom Groundhog Day. I do, I do executive coaching, I do some teaching at university, and very active in environmental groups in my community, doing a series of webinars, which are really continuing that theme that I first read in the last hours of ancient sunlight. Mm. Oh, I love that. I'm very excited for this conversation because so much of what you're saying there just is, it's exactly the sort of stuff that I love to discuss. Um, my, my listeners will definitely attest to my, my love of these discussions around uh, the direction of humanity <laughs> heading down <laughs> a, a ghastly path. Um, well, one thing that really interests me is so you, you live in this beautiful place, Sussex, you said in a national park, um, mm. you know, thousands of years old. Um, something I've always always kind of romanticized about is, you know, you, you, you live in England, which is just so rich in culture. Um, and, you know, you can walk past buildings that are thousands of years old. Um, and, you know, this is something that, say, in America or in Australia, we just wouldn't get, you know, it's, we, we've kind of got the aftermath of this great civilization that, that bloomed in, in Great Britain. What's it like having that kind of perfect mix of, of beautiful nature and also like the cultural significance there? Like, is that one of the reasons why you decided that this is where you wanted to live? Yeah, very much so. Um, I found living in the States, um, there's still, there, there are some wonderful groups, wonderful people there, but still the dominant culture, which we're seeing now, it's about money. Money is valued more than human life. Uh, this is the great tragedy. In fact, corporations have more human rights than humans do in America. Mm. And, uh, and this obsession about money, status, competitiveness, affluence, meant I, I just literally felt I was being suffocated. And I came back to England. And don't get me wrong, there's very strong materialism here, as I'm sure there is in Australia and every country of the world. But here, there's also many other cultures. And you say there's a richness in the history, in our legacy, and I think what really brought it home to me was when I was, when I was teaching at Oxford, you know, there are buildings I was teaching in that were 800 years old. The, mm -hmm. the main lecture hall where I gave my lectures was where T. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, who was a fellow in the School of Geography, used to deliver lectures. And that, you know, that history and going in dining rooms, like at Cambridge, where, where Darwin had sat, where Newton, the chair, where Newton, you know, used to sit, there's it's an extraordinary feeling of having that culture. And here in, the, Sus in uh, the South Downs, you have the connection to nature, but you also can go to London, which is one of the most modern, vibrant cities in the world. And I think what makes London unique is the combination of a history going back to Roman times and before, but you've also got this amazing modern, um, you know, the rich theatre life, the arts, the restaurants, the, the commerce, the buildings, and you have got, for a small island, you're right, it is an extraordinary mix. And uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't live anywhere else. But for me, and I've noticed, I don't know if you noticed it, Simon, but since we've had the pandemic, there's been a big push for people moving out to the countryside and leaving cities. And we're seeing this in the States as well, because people appreciate green space so much more. Mm. And the beautiful national park I live in, I, I cannot rate it, rate it highly enough. And there's a lot of scientific evidence now that being in nature is one of the best cures for anxiety, for depression, and increasing our overall well-being. Mm. Yeah, and 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 this is this is interesting as well. It's it's like I, I really think that this whole pandemic has almost woken a lot of people up to the fact that there is so much more than the nine to five job, which they, which they once went to every single day. Um, and, and that's why you see people posting, Oh, they're learning an instrument now on Facebook, or, you know, they're, they're getting back into their music or their culture or um, mm. following some sort of path that's meaningful to them. And something I've been thinking about lately and something that uh, kind of you, you've touched on there with the culture that, that you're surrounded by as well is, my wife and I were planning a trip to Germany next year. And one of the biggest things that I want to do is I want to visit as many cathedrals as I can, as many amazing, you know, rich cultural buildings that, 
you know, took hundreds of years to build and then have lasted throughout the centuries. And one of the reasons is because like you say, you can feel of the presence of just the magnificent, uh, you, you know, culture that has resided in that building for so long. Mm. And now you look at, you, you can see the cultural development go into these places like America and Australia. And, mm. you know, you might go to a, a university over here and it might just be so bland and, and, <laughs> you know, just such a, such a corporate building, you know, do, mm. do you, th- it's not necessarily a question of, do you think we've lost touch with, with the importance of architecture and culture and, 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 and doing something exquisite, but how do you think we get back to that? How do you think we get back to paying attention to those things that, I mean, last hundreds, thousands of years? Um, and, and how can we do that individually yeah. too? Well, it's a very good question. Um, for me, it's coming back to, first of all, being aware of our worldview, and not just our worldview as individuals, but collectively, that we have created by design and by default this worldview that places all the emphasis on money, on corporatism, Mm. on everything being a means to an end, and normally a financial end. Um, Even in, there's this phrase we used to use in California a lot called spiritual materialism, where even things like yoga, mindfulness are turned into a business. It's like, you know, I think of Star Trek, the Borgs, the way they turn everything into a Borg. There's this massive toxic culture that commodifies everything. And hopefully during this period of the lockdown, which I think has been longer in England, um, probably with you, we've had a chance to to pause and and reflect on what's really important. So in my local community, we did a survey uh, for about 300 people Um, across a a range of people, some environmental, some not, to ask them what were the biggest lessons and insights in this period. And about 90% said, we've really enjoyed slowing down. We've realised that there is a different pace of life. And we had time to do things like learn an instrument, like maybe learn about art, or read books and, and great books, you know, Dickens or Austin or Dostoevsky, things that we hadn't done before that we delayed because we were so busy being overscheduled. So I think, you know, there's more than one culture, but in, in, in essence, there's two different paths we can go on. We can either go back to normal, to that, what I call this toxic culture, where money is king, where everybody's rushing around overscheduled on autopilot, trying to acquire more, 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 or we can go down a very different path, which is putting the emphasis on the quality of art, the quality of our interior life, the quality of our soul. And in many respects, this is a stoic theme. Mm And going back to what's really fundamental and important about human life, which is just the experience, the gift of being alive, that appreciation. But we actually have everything we need uh, to be happy now, but we're constantly torn away by this this system telling us, no, you haven't got enough. No, you can't be happy till you have more, 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 you know, uh, and that Jeff Bezos becomes the hero of our planet, not an artist, not, you know, somebody doing good in a voluntary society, not, but what's interesting also is that certainly in England, I don't know if it's the same with you, but we've had this new appreciation of the essential workers, people who might only be earning a few dollars an hour, you know, not just nurses and doctors, but the cleaners in the hospitals, the people delivering food, people working in shops. But these have been our new heroes, and I really hope this continues and we don't go back to idolising financiers and bankers and entrepreneurs as our gods, because they're not. Mm. Yeah. And and there's al- it, it seems like there's almost a... Um an out of body, ex, uh, not experience, an out of body perspective that we need to have, which says that th- this and, you know, the money that we get, the things that we get, that's not what's most important. It, it's interesting to think of, you know, hundreds of years ago, what was the mindset of a person who went in and said, you know what, I'm going to labor, labor my entire life to build something like a cathedral, even though I may not see it finished, you know, what's, Mm -hmm. what's the, how do you, how do you get into that mindset? And and it seems like we have, we have narrowed our scope of what is acceptable for us to spend our time on to such a degree that it's just like, if it doesn't end with a dollar in our hand, it's, it's, it's not worth it. Right. 
And, Absolutely. and I really like what you said there about uh, getting us to understand what, what we actually have, what we can have in each moment, which is an appreciation for life and the simple moments in life that it's like poetry, you know, it's yeah. telling the story of something so minute that you would never notice if you didn't actually pay attention. But I, I want to jump back into all of this because this is such interesting stuff, especially talking about COVID and America and everything like that. But mm-hmm. The wisdom of Groundhog Day. I've been really fascinated lately with with watching movies, not just to watch it, but to get the meaning out of it. Mm. What was it about yeah. Groundhog Day that, <laughs> that particularly stood out to you? And uh, and yeah. and how did you how did you follow that up with them um, with finding the the deeper meaning? Well, you know, when when I talk about Groundhog Day, when I meet people for the first time, I think half the people look at me as though I'm insane, and the other half get it straight away. Yeah. So. I'm a movie buff. That's the first thing I should say. I watch all the movies and, you know, I could write about Casablanca, you know, Gone with the Wind. Well, I'm not not to talk about Gone with the Wind now, but The Godfather, all these other great films. But there was something about Groundhog Day when I first watched it in the cinema in 1993, 27 years ago, that I had almost a spiritual experience. And at the time, I couldn't articulate what it was. I knew I loved it as a comedy, you know, the romance neither here nor there but as comedy it was brilliant but it touched me in a very deep way that I didn't fully understand and about two years later I was delivering a a course a leadership course and I just said oh that's how that feels like Groundhog Day and this was before Groundhog Day became that idiom that everybody's using now and the people in the group said yeah it does it feels like this sense of repetition so i started to delve into the idea and i i met by total coincidence about 20 years ago danny rubin who was the screenwriter uh, harold ramus director uh, finished a lot of the work on the script but the, the the big idea about being stuck in the same day forever came from mm-hmm. Danny Rubin, which was just a brilliant idea. And I met Danny and we became friends and we decided to write books. So he wrote the introduction, I wrote the book. And for me, I wanted to delve into this concept of we are all living Groundhog Day, but Groundhog Day is the human condition. And what I mean by that is, you know, you might be in Australia today or London tomorrow, take over the next day, but in our interior life, we are replaying the same day, the same patterns day after day after day. We get stuck in our beliefs, we get stuck in our habits, we get stuck in our behaviours. And I think of people in my family who are in their 90s who are still going through the same patterns that they were as children. Now, things vary, but I would say 90% of our thoughts, our feelings, our reactions are the same day after day after day. And the tragedy in life is there's really two worlds we operate in. There's the outer world of other people, events, situations, money, etc. Then there's our inner world, our inner world of experience, of beliefs, of feelings, of values. Yet 99% of our effort goes into our outer world. Groundhog Day is a story of somebody who suddenly the outer world was basically removed from them because they, they couldn't get out of the town. They couldn't get away from the people. They couldn't even get away from the same day. They were trapped forever in the same day. So Phil, Phil Connors, played by Bill Murray, had to put all his attention onto changing his inner world. And by doing that, he turned the worst day of his life into the best day of his life. And this struck me as probably the most exciting thing that you can do in life is by taking your focus away from your outer life to your inner life you can transform your reality, not through drugs, not through some cheap, you know, delusion, but through genuine psychological, spiritual change at a level. You can, and I think this links in with Stoicism, with Buddhism, you can generate your own reality. So if you think about it in the film, he went through all these iterations, say over 30 years of being trapped in the same day. Nothing changed outside of him, but by changing his inner world, he created this beautiful outer world and went from the worst day of his life to the best day of his life. And in my book, I show the exact way he does it, backed up by evidence from from psychology, philosophy, spirituality. Mm. Mm. It's all there. Yeah, it, it, it's so interesting. And and, and what I think is so uh, so cool about um, your approach here is people don't realize how deep movies actually are. 
<laughs> you know, like it, because it, I think that Jordan Peterson kind of says he, he's like Disney movies, for example, uh, are these movies that 99% of people just love and they just adore it and they get into it and it changes their life, but they have no idea why. But if you actually pay attention, like every movie has some sort of deeper meaning and, and I, I really think that the the meaning that you you get from Groundhog Day is uh, is is very profound because every day, I mean, we have the choice, right, to get up and just go throughout our day with our normal set of cognitive processes and do what we've always done, which we all do, or we can say, let's pay attention to the moments where I can actually influence this and, and make this day even better. Let's pay attention to those tiny moments. And I, I was listening to you recently and you said something that I really wanted to uh, touch on. You said you want to look for, find and follow the clues of life. That was really fascinating to me because that seems very similar to the stoic idea of a more fatty, which is love your fate or, yeah. you know, whatever happens to you, love it, welcome it. And you can find those clues. But what do you mean by looking for finding and following the clues? Well, there's two levels. So it's coming back to our talk about Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day, another reason I love the movie and have used it as a process for change is because he doesn't have a guru. He doesn't have you know, a Jedi telling him what to do, which is, you know, in this version of a hero story, he has to do it all himself through trial and error. He treats his life like a science. So he will, like a scientific experiment. So every day he will, he will try something new and see how it works. If it works, he'll carry on with it. If it doesn't work, he'll do something different every day. This is, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of growth mindset, Carol Dreck's mm. work, the idea of constantly reiterating, experimenting, trying something new, rather than spending all our time trying to be defensive. But there's also a deeper meaning to this. And the deeper meaning for me, which I've only really got over the last few years, I guess through age or some sort of evolution, is that is to embrace everything. But most of my life, I've tried to control my outer world, trying to, I have preferences. I like this. I don't like that. This is good. This is bad. Judging people, judging events. We all do it. But for me, the real evolution in life is starting to see everything as a learning experience, everything as a resource, a resource to grow from. And normally, if you look back on your life, and this was true in Groundhog Day as well, he learns the most, we all learn the most from the bad experiences. Now, at the time, we try to push them away. We try to distract ourselves. We try to deny them. But as we grow and get the ability to embrace difficulties, to stay with the feeling, to learn, to grow, that is really the stuff of growth, far more important than money, far more important than all the things we think we want. And if you can transform your life from trying to control your experiences and judge your experience to embracing every minutiae of your experience and paying attention to everything, that truly is a path. That's why books like The Power of Now have become so popular, because there is a profound truth. What Eckhart Tolle does is really take thousand-year-old traditions from Buddhism, from Stoicism, from Hindu, you know, other Indian spiritual uh, backgrounds, and turn it into language which we can all understand. Hmm. And it, it's even it's even kind of like a, a biblical idea as well. You know, you yeah. see this um, throughout the, the biblical stories of you know, like you were saying, just get out there and do something and then learn from it. That's, that's a very big, uh, you know, ancient religious idea as well. Just get out there in the world, try something new, experiment. And as you do so, if you're paying attention, if your eyes are open, if your ears, ears are hearing, you're going to find things that you can improve. And um, honestly, I found that in my own life as well, that the more I just get out there and try things, it's never going to be right. It's never going to be the correct path, but there's always something that can teach me something better about, you know, how to, how to face the world. And, you know, we're really dealing with kind of an awkward situation with young people today that I think has its roots in this kind of mindset of kind of an unwillingness to get out there and just start trying things and to start experimenting and start seeing what you're actually made of. Cause one thing that I've been thinking lately, uh, Paul is, is, 
you know, there's a lot of people who are angry with the state of the world at the moment, Mm. myself included. There's a lot of Mm. stuff going on. There's a lot of terrible things going on. But something that always gives me confidence is to think that, you know what, I'm only really 10, 20, 30 years away from being the the person who makes the decisions, you know, being in the position of the people who I despise right now. So why don't I start getting out there, trying some things, like you're saying, you know, uh, developing skills. How do you think we can give young people today a confidence in themselves enough to maybe stop complaining so much about their culture and start actually trying to add to it in, in productive ways um, and, and start improving upon it? Well, it's a very good question, um, Simon. I mean, that's, for me, come back to what I was just talking about, this concept of the growth mindset is the key. I think the tragedy of education, and, you know, and I've taught at all levels of education, is there's too much focus on the subject. There's too much focus on education as a means to an end, a way of going to the right university, the right job, earning more, mm. etc. There needs to be a radically different uh, education in areas such as mindfulness, in areas such as getting out in resilience, in agility, in a growth mindset. And it's funny, there's talk in this country at the moment, there's a group of uh, people, some very influential, who are trying, because we're going to have such high unemployment coming up, and a lot of people leaving, you know, school, university, just not going to have jobs because of the, the depression we're all heading into. There's a lot of talk about bringing some back, some form of national service. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, back in the 1950s, every, um, certainly every man who reached the age of uh, I think it was 18 had to do two years national service in the army. Now we're talking about the concept of national service as volunteers, national service in nature, to go and act, you know, it might be only for six months, but the idea of getting groups of people together, young people together, working on a great project, for me, and this is not just a problem with young people, it's with with everyone, Mm. it's getting out of our heads, getting out of, um, you know, being self-absorbed. It's putting other people first. It's think, and, and because when you're totally self-absorbed, you're looking at social media all day, you're comparing yourselves all day, you're thinking about your exams, you, you, that is naturally going to lead to extreme anxiety. It's going to lead naturally to entitlement, into self-obsession. And that might give you some things of pleasure for a while, but it, long term, it's a disastrous way to live. And again, I think the stoic idea is, you know, not just living, ruminating all the day. You, you, it's about doing and being and it's getting out of your head and getting away. I think above all, getting away from the screen. So <laughs> getting away yeah. from your iPhone, getting away from um, social media, because that's just going to reinforce this toxic way of thinking about the world of status of comparison. You can never be happy if you're comparing yourself with what you've, haven't got or what you're missing out on it's it, and i think mm. we, all these things are linked together and i wouldn't claim to i wouldn't patronize people because i think a lot of adults have this problem as well older people it's not just to, but I, I i really feel for the younger generation now with social media being so powerful because i think it really exaggerates these tendencies that have always been there mm. yeah social media is definitely one of those uh kind of I don't know, devils in the closet, you know, that, that we, we, we don't fully understand the extent uh, to which it is um, shaping our future, you know? Mm. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going to have my little, you know, apocalypse moment and then we can move on. Mm. But what, what do you think is going on in America right now from your perspective? Uh, how do you see this as somebody who is, who is yeah. also an expert in organizational Uh, you know psychology which is just a microcosm of the larger community right so what do you see going on well for your listeners just to know i I lived in the states from 2005 to 2012 and i still read probably watch and read american news more than the english news because the united states is so important uh to the rest of the world i think what really has that happened is the coronavirus has exposed fundamental flaws in the American system. You know, of course, we'll all have our views about Trump, and I'm sure everyone listening to his program sees him for what he is, but this this is much, much deeper than this. The coronavirus has exposed the gross inequality in the States. You know, I lived in a very wealthy part of the States, but as you go inland from California, literally every five miles, you, you were amazed at how 
you can find the poorest people I've ever seen in my life living in the States in this incredibly affluent country. And I think the coronavirus has exposed the inequality. It's exposed the, the health service, which is catastrophic for people who don't have money, who can't afford it. Um, it's exposed the political system, how toxic it is, that they can't work together. Um, that, 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 that it has been politicised, it's been weaponised by the politicians, so that even wearing a mask has become this political statement. Um, it's, and it's shown also, for me, one, at the heart of American problems, of all the countries in the world, it's the most corporate. Corporations run America. There was a brilliant book written by David Corton a few years ago called When Corporations Rule the World, saying that we're, this is our geological period, if you like. And, um, and they do rule the world. And if you've got money, if you've got lobbyists, it runs everything. Corporations have more rights than human beings. Co money, the stock market, executives have more value than human beings, than society. And we're now seeing the effects of that. That America doesn't, unlike our countries, unlike most of Europe, they do not have the public health service, they do not have the, the, the political systems at federal, state or local level to deal with this. And we're now seeing runaway coronavirus. We're now talking about 54,000 infections yesterday, um, July the 1st, and we're, we're going to be at 100,000 by the end of the month. And it is truly catastrophic. Um, and I, I really worry about what's happening in the States. I'm hoping everything will be all right. I'm worried about the election coming up. I'm worried about so many different things because, of course, the United States is still the most influential country in the world and we want it to work well. You know, we, we wish it well, but it, it, the country is suffering terribly at the moment. Mm, of course. And, and, and that's the thing, you know, like I think that there's a lot of people who would be very excited about it kind of going downhill very quickly. I think uh, that there's a lot more people around the world who who know just how catastrophic it would be for the world if if America were to continue its uh, ever increasingly quickly uh, you know march towards death and uh, and so yeah we we really want to um, pay attention to how we can you know change that I guess or at least um, at least change ourselves so that the, the the blow isn't so terrible but what would you say to people who who are in the states right now dealing with all this sort of stuff and they're thinking man i can't fix the health system i can't mm. fix inequality i can't fix all this by myself what what do you what do you do like what what is your duty as a citizen <sighs> Well, I think you've just hit the nail on the head. So I'm doing a series of webinars in the UK at the moment, um, which are about the concept of being a citizen, not a consumer. And I think this is a very important, we understand this distinction. Citizenship means being responsible, being part of society. Consumer means being irresponsible, means being an individual and doing what you will. But America, until America shifts and being a consumer society to a citizenship. And it used to be far more that way. You know, consumerism mm. is a very modern phenomenon. If you look at the history, it basically goes back to the 1920s. And there's a whole history we could talk about. But um, I encourage people to, to understand that this is a very modern phenomenon. And it's not the only story in town. There's a far deeper story around citizenship, about being a we society rather than a me society. And I think the real tragedy, just coming back to the previous point as we were talking about political systems, is all the world's biggest problems, whether it be coronavirus, whether it be climate change, inequality, poverty, uh, mass migration, are global problems. Yet the problem is our political systems are set up for problems of 50 years ago, not these modern global problems. They're still too insular, they're too limited, they're too corporate, they're too financial, short-term thinking. I've always been a big believer in some form of world government, strengthening the UN. I know there's many problems, it might sound idealistic, but the fact is the coronavirus and climate change will be a hundred times worse proves that we have to change everything. We have to fundamentally change the system. But of course, Trump will say you're being a socialist, you know, you're communist, all this old nonsense coming out. But this is for our survival. 
as a species, not just for thriving as a species, for our survival. Because if you look at what's actually happening in the climate and you look at the numbers of coronavirus and everything else, we're on a one-way road to complete disaster. And this is the science talking. This is not me as some, mm. you know, far hippie left-wing person. I know the science very well and it's terrifying. But our institutions are bankrupt. Businesses, the stock market, politics are completely ill-equipped and our culture is completely ill-equipped to deal with mm. these problems. So we have to, yeah. you know, come back to your question, mm. join communities, be active, don't hide. Don't hide thinking it's going to go back to normal because it won't. Mm. And, and, and I really like uh, the discussion around citizenship and duty is seriously something that I think that we've lost. Uh, we, we really have. And, and because people don't talk about that enough, this, you know, like what is the responsibility that you have as a citizen to, you know, beyond the protesting, what do you have as a responsibility to, to get out there and actually enact some of these changes within your microcosm that you have? And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm against protesting. I'm very much for protesting. If, if there's a massive issue that needs to be brought to the attention of, of the authorities, absolutely. But uh, at some point we need to have the discussion of, what do you do in your own life in order to make the, the nation stronger? Um, yeah. And I, I wanted to, to kind of discuss your, your experience with organizational psychology, mm -hmm. uh, because I think that we can actually have an interesting discussion here about, you know, what ruins an organization, what strengthens an organization, because it's, it's just a representation of a nation, right? So, what is it that crushes a nation, a, a, an organization? When you go in to speak to them, what do you see as the biggest thing that ruins it? Well, yes, I mean, that's very much my professional work for, you know, the last 30 years or so. You know, when I started um, doing leadership training, it was all about profitability, productivity, success, you know, like those Tony Robbins videos, and all seven habits, all that stuff, more success, achievement. But there's been a shift I've noticed in the last few years. Uh, well, in my work, it's now much more around well-being and engagement. It's more around teaching mindfulness. It's more around teaching a more soulful approach to business. So I now work with organizations that have very strong values. But for me, the big issue in, I'm seeing in organizations are people want something very different. They want to bring all of themselves to work, not just their productive part, not just their financial part. They want to personally develop, spiritually develop at some level at work. So the organizations become places where you can feel truly engaged. The tragedy is that most surveys show that only about 15 to 20% of people feel engaged at work. And it's not always to do with position or money. Often I've worked with hotels where the directors are miserable, depressed, unhappy, often alcoholics, whereas the people cleaning the rooms are joyful, are happy. You mentioned earlier the, about cathedrals. There's a great analogy you might have heard about um, an interviewer met three people working on a cathedral. He asked the first person, what are you doing? And he said, uh, I'm laying bricks. He asked the next person, what are you doing? I'm building a wall. He asked the third person, what are you doing? I'm building a cathedral. Because that third person had meaning, significance, which is my new book, all about the concept of significance at work. And people want that. They want meaning. They want to be engaged. They want to feel well. They want to feel happier. This whole area of positive psychology now is, is coming into MBAs. I've just um, developed a new course for a Canadian university, and there's a big emphasis on authentic leadership, on positive leadership. People want to deal with other people, not with some caricature of a manager just talking about productivity. People want to be authentic. They want to be genuine. They want to be engaged. They want to find meaning. They want to be in the flow. You know, we understand from motivation that more than our need for money is our need for autonomy, our need for feeling appreciated, our needing for feeling that we're growing, being part of something bigger than ourselves. And those organisations that tap into that human need the needs of our soul as opposed to just the needs of our ego. They're going to be the winners. You know, yes, of course, they have to attend to other business issues of productivity and leadership. Um, but I hope that there'll be a fundamental change in business models. I really do, because they, business is really at the heart of everything that's wrong in our world, the way it's done at the moment. Mm. And, and do you think that businesses are heading in a direction where 
uh, virtue is is more at the forefront um, because it is being demanded more from the public view? Well, I think a lot there's an aspiration to move in that way but there are some severe structural limits the biggest limit is the fixation on short-term profit if you take mm -hmm. coming back to the states you know if you're a public company you have to um, show quarterly profits which means it's very difficult to take long-term decisions in a way it's difficult for politicians to make long-term decisions because they're all designed the next election cycle so what we need to do is change the structures to enable the long-term systemic structural change that's required for us to survive as a species we can't see business as a game to get rich quick anymore we have to see it as an institution but it's having a significant material effect on the quality of life around the world so private businesses i think have more scope and agility for freedom but the fact is the cut the organizations of the biggest power in the world are the big organizations the googles the apples the toyotas the Deutsche Banks of the world, you know, they, and they, for them to change, we have to change the rules of the game. We have to change the way money is invested, the way shares work, the way accountability. And at a deeper level, Simon, we need to move away from this fixation of GDP, gross domestic product, and economic indicators as countries' well-being, more towards well-being indicators, like they're doing now in um, in Scandinavia quality of life, quality of community, because all the evidence points to the fact that the happiest people are in the happiest communities, where the gap between rich and poor is far smaller. It's not about wealth, it's about um, community, about your well-being, your happiness is based on um, feeling part of something bigger than yourself, on volunteering, on other people, and we can't, we've got to get away from this individualistic paradigm that's dominated post-war world. Mm. And, and it kind of starts, obviously, at the individual level, right? So we've talked about, you know, the world and we've talked about America and companies, you know, what makes them flourish or the, the people at least flourish. On a very individual level, uh, what are some steps that you think people can take in order to find more meaning in their lives? Well, what's worked for me, and certainly my clients I work with and what I teach, is there's different levels. First of all, as I said earlier, focus more on your inner life and less on your outer life. So spend more time um, doing my mindfulness, I really think, is critical. Now, there are many different versions of that. There, there's formal meditation. You know, some people meditate eight hours a day, some 10 minutes a day. But for me, it's more around paying attention to each moment. So I think being more mindful, waking up in the morning and going to bed at night focusing on what's good in your life rather than what's wrong we've all had a lot to focus on what's been wrong recently and uh, but there's always an amazing gratitude around us you know the chances of you and i sitting here are so many trillions to one against it ever happening us even being born it's not even worth contemplating yet we put all our emphasis on what we don't have in our life rather than the, 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 the beautiful gift of life as einstein said you can see your life that nothing's a miracle but everything's a miracle if you switch to mm. seeing everything as a miracle and this is a proof the brightest man in history suggesting this you know it is a wonderful way to live but i think then so attend to your inner life and notice where your thoughts are but also, I think it's very important to join a group where you can develop your soul, if you like, develop. And, and I'm not just talking about formal religion here. I'm not religious, but I think we have a profound need to be with people who share our values. That could be through volunteering. It could be uh, joining a more spiritual group. There's a whole number of ways we could go. But take decide on the path you want to go, then try and change your inner life, but also your outer life more to, uh, to go in that direction. And doing good, a tremendous amount of evidence that showed that volunteering, focusing on other people's needs rather than your own, really makes you happier. And for younger people, it's a great way to meet other good people. It's a, you know, it ticks on awful lot of boxes. Whereas just going back to seeing yourself as a consumer, I'm here to shop, acquire, get more, look at social media is a one way route to despair, I promise you. Hmm. And, and I think that what's important here is for those people who are listening, who maybe are still stuck in the, uh, you know, dollar first kind of 
kind of mindset, which I think we all are to some extent, you know, it's, it's not as if I don't hope that, uh, you know, by doing this podcast and talking to great people, that people will support me in the ways that will allow me to keep on doing it. But, uh, to put it in the, the kind of phrasing, you know, volunteering, giving, giving money to good causes, you know, the return on investment that you get mentally, spiritually from doing something like that, is far greater than, than spending your money anywhere else. And, and that's really the proof of the pudding, right? Yeah, one of the books I use, I'm using in, this, in my university work, but also my private coaching is Adam Grant's book, Giver, Givers and Takers, or Giving and Taking. He's a professor at Wharton Business School, and it doesn't get more corporate than that. But what he's done is over the last 20 years, he's shown that the most um, effective leaders in particular are people who give. And not just giving in terms of, oh, I give to you, it's like a transaction, you give to me, which is very much the sort of corporate way, but giving unconditionally giving out of love, giving out of compassion, out of a genuine desire to help others, and you will be repaid many fold back. Whereas people who are more takers, or what he calls matchers, matchers are people who give on the assumption that they're going to get something back. They don't do nearly as well in their career, nor are they as happy. So you came back to that question earlier about what are the clues in life. There are very strong clues which are empirically researched. And one clue is giving is good for you. Another clue is that growth mindset is very good for you. Another clue is being mindful, paying attention to the moment is very good for you. Not just in your personal life, but also in your professional life. And this is, you know, there is a, an algorithm, if you like, for living. There is a way of living. And I, I write about this in all my books, but that is empiric evidence base which does show how you can be happier and if you choose to be more successful mm. but success in a much broader sense but it's difficult for people to make that leap right yeah you know, because it it, it it you know I, I even think about this in terms of faith you know it really it takes a lot of faith especially when we're so drilled into this commercial kind of lifestyle it takes a lot of faith to actually believe that if you aim at virtue, if you aim at service, at giving, things will go well for you. And because, because things going well for us, we always think as money. That's what yes. things going well for us exactly. is. But, yeah. but that's not what going well for us actually is, right? Well, um, my most recent book, Significance, is all about the power of stories. So, when I did my master's in, uh, in social psychology, we looked at the power of attitudes and how uh, our worldview, our attitudes inform and affect all our behavior and often at an unconscious level. I use the term stories to say that we have, most of us have a default life story which governs our experience of the world. And that story is normally a mixture of our, our parenting our upbringing, our formative experiences at school, but also our conditioning at work, at university, college. But above all, I think, our cultural conditioning, which is so pervasive and insidious, we're not aware of it half the time. And, that's, and we are not living reality. We're living our story of reality. Mm. And once you understand that, that's a very important distinction. And I think the first step in change is to say, what is the story I'm telling myself right now? So if that first default impulse is to say, oh, how can I get more money from this? Or what's this costing me? What's the cost benefit of doing this? Then you are still in your old story. And you need, we all need a new story. We need a new story globally in our country, socially, community-wise, but it all starts with us having a new story about what it means to be human, a new story about what is real happiness, what is the purpose of our life, what do we really stand for. Once we're clear on that story, we can start to make moment-to-moment decisions, rather like Phil does in Groundhog Day. He mm. had an old story, but he just wanted to be wealthy, a weatherman, he hated Punxsutawney, he hated the people, he despised, was cynical about everything. But the, the story he developed through his experience was love, community, giving, compassion. And look how much happier he was. Yes, it's a film, but it's also a universal truth. Going back to Buddha, Jesus, mm. all the way through psychology, spirituality, now positive psychology. It is a universal truth. That is the only story for real happiness. And I think 
really thinking about the story you're telling yourself at any moment is a great way to start this process. And then it's just work and practice. You, there's no other way around it. It's not going to happen overnight, mm. whatever people say to you. <laughs> mm. and, 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 you know, when you talk about clues, it's like we have, we have all of these answers right in front of us. We've got your book. Further on that, we've got the Bible. We've got Seneca. We've got Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus. We've got, you know, the, 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 you, you've got Hinduism. You've got Buddhism. You've got all of this. Ama- what, what surprises me most, Paul, is the fact that we have the knowledge of our generations that have led to us at our fingertips closer than it's ever been before. You can Google it in a second. You've got any information that you want. And do we take the time to say, hang on, like, what are they trying to say here? What, what was the mindset that they had back then when they were writing it? What did they think about the soul, about spirituality? What did they think about freedom, what it meant to be free? And, and I wanted to ask that as well. And this might be one of my last questions for you is you mentioned uh, taking care of the soul. What do you, what do you mean when you talk about spirituality, the soul, what, what is that to you? Well, soul is a word I never used to use um, because of my background in psychology. It was a, a term that was frowned upon, but as I've got older, I've realized like Einstein did, like uh, Viktor Frankl did, like a lot of, you know, humanistic psychologists have realized is that we do have, whether we call it our soul, whether we call it our authentic self, our higher self, our better nature, there's many expressions, there's a part of us that is naturally loving, compassionate, kind, living in the present moment, joyful, it's Phil at the end of the movie, it's us when we are playing, we've, we've got a new puppy, you might have heard it during the call, you know, it, it, when you're playing with a puppy, as long as he's not biting, <laughs> and when you're playing with children, when you're excited about something, when you're in the flow, is that part of us that comes out. And the more we can do to cultivate that part of us, the better. But I think there's a more important distinction here as well. Um, I don't, everything's on a spectrum, nothing's black and white, but I think there's two broad paths that we can take as individuals and as a society. There's a path of the ego, which is always looking to get more, is looking to win, be competitive, to look good, to be in control, to have power, to be recognised and appreciated. And our businesses are built on that, our politics is built on that, sport, of course, is built on that. So much of our culture is structured around that ego. But then there is our soul, that part of us, our inner life. The ego is all about your outer life. It's all about things happening in the outside world to give us the feelings we want. Our inner life is about learning how to get those feelings we all want of being loved, of feeling connected, of having meaning, being motivated, inspired. But we can generate those feelings ourselves. And that's taking care of the soul. It's being grateful, it's, it's being mindful, it's walking in nature, it's volunteering, it's listening to people, it's helping, it's suspending judgment and practicing these things, it's journaling. Every day, journal, oh my God, I cannot stress how important it is. It's listening to high quality audios in the car rather than just having the radio on or listening to mm. what Trump said today on his tweets. You know, it, it, it's really cultivating that side of you because the more you go down that road, the happier you will be and the more compassionate you will be and you will start to live the stoic principles, the Buddhist principles. They will become reality. It's a lifetime's journey and you're always going to be pulled back onto that ego path. But if every day you say, which path am I going to go down? And it's not going to be black and white, but the more you can go towards that soul path, the more you can have the joy that Phil had at the end of Groundhog Day or the joy that you will see in people who who cultivate their inner life. That is the only way to live. And my favourite word of all, which I really emphasise, if you forget about everything else I've said, it's word appreciation. Learn to consume less and appreciate more. Mm. Because every, I suspect almost everyone listening to this podcast has, has what they need to be happy, has what they need. And we need to get away from this focus of, oh, we can only be happy when all these conditions happen because that will never mm. make us happy. I promise you. Yeah. I think that that's good advice. You put it better than I ever could. And, and just gratitude is, man, I've been saying that on this podcast for so long, gratitude is like the 
the the the cornerstone of 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 what it means to to live a, a a meaningful life you know so many virtues spring forth when you start to develop gratitude now paul my final question for you um and and i just i'm so grateful that you came on the show today i want to have you back many more times because we could continue all of this um now I'm going to have the links to all your books in the show notes and everything so that people can grab them. But you're a movie buff apart from mm-hmm. groundhog day, top <laughs> three to five movies that you think everybody should watch if they want to learn how to live a good life. Oh, well, um, to learn how to live a good life, Shawshank Redemption mm. contact. And the reason some of you might not have seen Contact, that was a film with Jodie Foster and Matthew McGonaghy from a 90s based on a Carl Sagan novel. And it's, it's a very deeply spiritual movie. And Carl Sagan was a famous astronomer who was also spiritual. And it puts our world into perspective and, and the miracle of life on this planet. Uh, a lot of people, so I'm not such a big Star Wars fan, but there's a profound story. And the heroes, any film that has the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's work is a good film to watch. But I'm going to be honest, Groundhog Day has everything. I, I would rather watch Groundhog Day 10 times than, than watch other films because every time I watch it, and I've watched it 50 times, Simon, at least I get more out of it. It, it, mm. it, you know, it is so profound when you really understand what's going on there at mm. this deep level. Uh, but yeah, those would be some films I'd recommend. I love it. I'm going to, I'm going to chuck that in the show notes as well so that people can grab them. But, uh, um, and you know, I just, just one last comment as well that you've watched it 50 times and you get more out of it every time. I just want to share with people and, and you, you probably can comment on this as well. Don't you think that the, the thing about art and culture and, and, and movies and literature is a really good story is something that you can come back to every time and still get something new from it. It's so complex, so complicated that you can't get to the bottom of it yeah. unless you keep on watching and watching it. Don't you think that that's the essence of what it means to, to make true art? Oh, absolutely. That's very well put. You know, I remember um, as a 16 year old being taught Hamlet, how can a 16 year old really understand Hamlet? But when you mm. go back and read it as a 40 year old or as a 50 year old, oh my God, suddenly you understand it at so many different levels. And a truly great book, a great movie, a great piece of art, a great piece of music, you know, a Beethoven symphony, you can listen to and you will take from it where you are in your own stage in life, on your own journey. And true genius is transcending back to that immediate experience and having something which speaks to every age to every person and that's why we still read shakespeare 500 you know 400 years on it's why we still listen to beethoven and mozart while you know why we still watch movies like groundhog day or casablanca you know it, it speaks to us uh, through history in a, in a world where so much information is just disappears like you mm. know twitter feeds or yesterday's newspaper Truly great art is timeless. And for me, Groundhog Day has all those properties. It, it, I mm. believe people will watch it in 200 years' time. I hope so. I hope we're here in 200 years' time. <laughs> well, that's now that. I can't. <laughs> we, well, that's another podcast. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it all together. I'll bring Shakespeare together with your new book, Significance, with, uh, <laughs> you know, with, with stories, you know, as, as, our, um, as the, the main driving factor in our lives. Seneca, uh, the Stoic, said, he said, uh, life is like a play. It's not the length that matters, but it's the excellence of the acting. So, <laughs> yeah, that's what we're trying to do here. So, you know, Paul, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to talk to you, and I really hope we get to do it again. It's been an absolute delight, Simon. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to sign up for email updates, join my Patreon meetup groups that we hold weekly, or if you'd like to offer feedback or suggestions for future guests or topics on the show, then you can head to simonjedrew.com. There you'll also find information about how we can work one-on-one together with my alignment coaching, based around the philosophical principles found in Stoicism. Finally, if you are on Facebook, then I'd love to see you in our group, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But hey, 
I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I'll talk to you next time.